It is uh, member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, all things considered. I'm Dave Lawrence, and a uh, real fun time here. It's a guy I've gotten to speak to a number of times over the years, uh, and he's back with his band through Sunday at the Blue Note shows at 6.30 and 9. From War, original member, Lonnie Jordan, keyboardist, vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, and our guest right now on All Things Considered. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor. I love Hawaii. It's one of my favorite places to be in life. And you've played here for a long time. You've got a lot of special memories. One that I have with you, I remember getting an interview inside of the Diamond Head Crater. Ooh, well, I'm glad you remember. <laughs> right. I, it's, it's, I never expect people to remember that stuff, especially with yeah, the I kind of... I remember 1969 with Eric Burden. He had to remind me, yeah, I was with you guys. <laughs> no, no. I, I, it's just some things I... Uh, my memory, you know, I mean, as you get older, your memory uh, goes into what's called uh, convenient memory, <laughs> convenient memory. Hibernation is what I. Uh, okay, <laughs> well that too, and uh, I um, and I have uh, what's called uh, 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 forget me not things. You know, I can't remember everything. You know. Well, one of the things that's kind of cool about you is uh, this, you know, he's uh, the the original member of War, and he's kept this band going for a very long time. Can you describe a little bit how music was first introduced to you prior to starting the band? And, you know, because what it's kind of fermented what has been a legacy that became your entire career. Oh, well, for me, uh, I would say gospel music, uh, uh, the blues and uh, calypso music was... uh, my main inspiration that, that, that I used to listen to all the time, and a lot of a lot of bootleg African music, a lot of bootleg Latin music was well, actually afro Latin music you know that uh, didn 't have a catalog then or category that is and uh, I would listen to it, and it was like totally different from anything I ever heard when I was growing up and uh, then when I would turn on uh, some of the radio stations that were like daily, you know, in the people's ears, you know, the commercial radios, then I would listen to a jazz, Latin jazz, Afro jazz, you know. How old were you? Uh, shoot, I must have been about one year old. No, no. I was about... Uh, shoot. Teenager? Well, I was nine years old. Okay. Nine, and that's when I actually started playing organ. And, uh, and I got bored with that and started playing uh, percussion. How'd you, get, how'd you get your hands on the organ first? Uh, I played a C2 organ at Sears and Roebuck in Long Beach, California. And, uh, but, but I, I was playing percussion first. Percussion was my basic in- inspiration. And, and not only that, but I was playing a lot of drums. And, and when I picked up the organ, I realized that organ was like a percussion to me. And so more than solos, I was playing more of chords in a percussive style. You know, and uh, I would just play stuff like, you know, and that, that's how I would play, you know, and I, did, and I merged that into the band later on in the years. Then I learned how to take solos. Then I just go ahead and started playing the piano and, and realized that the ivories were even more percussion, you know, so that's my style. And I played timbales, of course, on uh, the majority of our records, you know, in the past. So, uh, you're a true multi instrumentalist, and and it definitely factors into the sound of the band and the experience that you see when you watch these guys. You're credited with being among the first three people to join the creators that would become Night Shift, eventually War. Explain that story for folks. Are you sure? Do you have the time? Well, as much as you want to, uh, I'll I'll edit it. <laughs> the truncated version. Yeah, you go, and then erase it. <laughs> I, uh, we, well, we uh, started out um, playing with Deacon Jones, you know, the number 49 of the football team, the Rams, the Los Angeles Rams at the time. And uh, he and uh, Dick Butkus, I believe it was, and Rosie Greer got together and bought this nightclub called the Ragdoll. Well, there was something else before. But anyway, the Ragdoll, then they needed a backup band, well, a house band. We eventually became the house band. And uh, we had a saxophone player at the time named Jay Contrelli, who came out of the band Love. And uh, so we, uh, on the side, we started playing a lot of acid jazz, they called it then. And, uh, but then our basic gig was uh, at the Ragdoll, playing behind Deacon Jones. We added some horns and started almost sounding like Don Ellis <laughs> and uh, jazz, you know. And, uh, and uh, Deacon Jones would do his show. He would sing and do push-ups, and he was pretty much competing with Rosie Greer because Rosie had a, 
uh, a song out at the time called I, I Who Have Nothing, <laughs> you know. And uh, so Deacon said, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And uh, also he had background singers who were the original Iquettes, Jesse, Robbie, and Van- Vanessa, Vanetta, I think, Vanetta, yeah. And uh, so we had it going on then, and, uh, and that's pretty much how we got started and got introduced to Eric Burden, Lee Oscar, and, and uh, Jerry Goldstein, producer, then and now, and manager Steve Gold back then, and Chris Huston, the engineer, and just the whole posse of people that were involved in our lives when we were young that helped us get our career off the ground. You mentioned Eric Burden. There's a great story of the inspiration for Spill the Wine, which was a huge, huge track with him in the band and your role as inspiration for that. <laughs> it's a long story. It was uh, in the Bel Air house. He, my manager and producer, were living together, having parties every night, celebrating Eric's new band that he was in search of uh, for so long and finally found it and he fell in love with us and and uh, it just so happened that one night we were at a party and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of entertainers, I won't mention names, I'll only mention one that I had a run-in with and who lived right behind Eric and was a, a, a groupie of Eric's at the time, Jim Morrison. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who Jim Morrison was from Bam Morrison or <laughs> the Morrison Steinway piano. I, uh, I had no clue. I knew who the, um, the British Invasion bands were. But I didn't know who Jim Morrison or Lydia Pence or any of the other American uh, 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 bands or uh, artists that were at the house at the time. But uh, Jim Morrison, I just remember this guy was there almost every night. Then you ask yourself, well, you must have been there every night if you saw him. Yeah. So he was there and he would wake up in the morning. I woke up in the morning. The guy's still there, (laughs) dressed up in a Superman outfit. And that particular night, in his Superman outfit, Eric and I was on the piano. We were creating this rhythm, which was Spill the Wine eventually. And this guy standing on top of the piano looking down, and everyone was ignoring him. And he, he, was, he kept looking at me and said, I bet you like to sock me. And he jumps down off the piano like Superman, <laughs> jumps down, gets in my face, and say, would you like to hit me? I said, Okay. And, uh, and I started, uh, you know, getting a weird feeling, and, uh, and I realized it was like I was getting, uh, uh, bouncing off this acid that he, he took, and everyone else in the place, because I, you know, I, I was young, big afro, bell bottoms, I was only drinking and smoking weed at the time, drinking whiskey and smoking weed, the W's and looking for women, www.com, and, uh, and, and, and this guy came up in my face and wanted me to hit him, and I said, man, get out of my face, I don't know you. And, uh, and I went like this. That's all I did. But I was, some, uh, Eric and Jerry, my producer, said that I hit him and I didn't. They only saw it from another angle. But actually I went like that, put my finger right about there. I didn't even touch him. And he started going backwards in slow motion. And I said, wow. And he, and he went into the fireplace and got into a fetus position and this lady, came in and said, where's James? James, James, where are you, James? You know, and she picked him up and took him home, this little guy. And I realized that he was a little guy, a short guy. And, uh, but Eric, at that moment, when all this was going on, he ran upstairs and grabbed his gun because he was pissed off. And he came downstairs and shot the chandeliers. And I, know, I ducked and, and, and I looked around. And I noticed no one else jumped or moved or anything. Everyone was on acid. And, I, and that was my first time being introduced to acid. I had no clue what it was. And it wasn't until later on when we started traveling, my first acid trip was here <laughs> in Hawaii, 30 stories up in a hotel. There wasn't that many hotels here then. It was, I think, in 70 or something like that. And uh, I... Uh, it. it, it <sighs> That's when we were just trying to learn each other and Eric was just trying to get a feel for us. But again, that was way before that party. That's incredible. And just to clarify in the, in the story, the Superman outfit Jim Morrison was wearing the, in, in that party, Jim Morrison had that, the Superman outfit on? Yeah. Uh, you know, I get my days and my years confused. Like, like I 
got, got my uh, I got my monies confused. That's why I got uh, sued uh, by my ex-wives. Um, uh, I get confused with numbers, but uh, yeah, I did the acid trip in Hawaii. I, that, that's when I was introduced. I was introduced to acid for the first time here in the late 60s, 70s, whatever it was. But then that party that occurred, I, I never did it anymore. And it just so happened it was so long before because I said I would never do it again. I think that was mescaline, and then whatever it was. Uh, and then, then the years went by, and then when I saw everybody in the house, I didn't know that everyone could be in one place at the same time and be high on different types of acid. And finally I was talking to someone, and they said, well, he's, and he was like a, a connoisseur on who had what. He said, oh, he's high on sunshine. <laughs> he's high on mescaline. And he, you know, they said, oh, wow. Cataloging their buzzes. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow. And again, I was the only one to jump because I didn't want to do it, and I didn't know that, um, uh, that they were high like that. And I, I, I told myself I would never do it, and I didn't. I never touched it. I had that, too much fear in me. It took over my mind, my body, my brains. Uh, you know, it's like too much like uh, a spiritual control that I didn't like. So. Yeah, well, that's a heavy thing, and, and that's a good way of describing it. You don't want anything anything controlling you like that. One of the great uh, connections, you've mentioned Eric a few times. Um, the last night of his life, it was September 18th, 1970. You, you guys, you were talking about Eric Bird, and I'm talking about another event that happened on September 18th, 1970. You guys were on stage at Ronnie Scott's. It was the last night of Jimi Hendrix's oh. life, and Jimmy comes, and, and you have the honor, the privilege, I don't know what you would call it, the milestone event of having him. What are memories of that evening? Well, well, we we discussed that we were going to be in England uh, when we were at the flats, not the flats, but the... Uh, those condominiums, whatever you call it, that uh, John uh, uh, um, uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, what's the name? Belushi. Belushi, yeah, John Belushi. And a lot of people were staying in on Sunset. I forget the name of those flats. But anyway, uh, Jimmy said he would be in England when we were there. So he came down that Tuesday night without any instruments. And I said, oh, man, should have bought you instruments so we could have jammed. So he said, I promise I'll bring it tomorrow, which was Wednesday. He bought it. And uh, it was no gimmicks. It was just a simple amplifier, you know, and no tricks. And we played Mother Earth for, for a whole hour. Everyone just took solos, man. And it, it, it was great. We just, uh, you know, we had, we reminisced the fact that we passed each other's path, you know, in the, in the past, you know, uh, playing the chitlin circuit, <laughs> that we call it. <laughs> back then you had both passed each other doing that yeah he was playing behind other people like that. little richard and all kinds of yes, people. the isley brothers and and but we were just playing emulating uh people like little willie john we had people who were em emulating marvin gay but we would play behind everybody you know and, and that that's pretty much how we ended up playing all different types of music but jimmy hendrix played a show uh pl played uh played with us that night and uh uh, ironically, he went back to Mother Earth that night, and it could have all been avoided because Monica didn't know what to do. She was t just young, scared, trying to finish school, and had the police busted her with drugs in the room. She, you know, it would have just been the end of her career as well, and they would have probably accused her of some wrongdoings, and she was just panicking. She didn't know all she had to do was turn him over. You know, so he suffocated on his own vomit. But no one's mad at him, uh, at her. You know, no one's mad. You know, it could have been avoided. He could have avoided it, you know, so. It's a powerful, powerful story. Um, some of the great songs, uh, it wouldn't be right to, before I let you go, just to hear a couple of the antidotes about some of the songs that you watch people. You know, when you play some of your songs, Lonnie, the room, there's a sense of nostalgia. Everybody has their own story, the place they were when they heard some of these songs, the memories they've made to them. And some of them are really powerful, emotional. So turning, uh, turning it around, looking at you, you, you hear a song like Lowrider. Take us back to the origins of that and maybe tell a, a good story that goes along with coming up with what has been one of these enduring classics. Oh, I, and I never believed that it would still be playing today. Uh, we didn't think any of our music would be playing because it was just too a little bit different, but now I call it unique. Uh, but uh, Lowrider, Charles Miller, who originally sing, sung the lead, our saxophone player, walked in the studio after he, just, he had just bought a 50 i believe a 52 chevy and he was proud of it 
he had a little bit too much tequila walked in the studio sat down on the on the uh, on this bench in front of a microphone and we already had the track already done but we we're just trying to figure out what to do with it and he came in with this tequila and, and uh, bottle of uh, the mezcal and uh, with the worm at the bottom and he had his salt and lemon and st- and his voice was messed up from drinking so he started singing low and there it was he just came up with this low rider <laughs> and that was it and we wrote the rest we wrote the rest of the song so we can come back so he can come back the next night and finish it <laughs> that's a great story how about slipping in the darkness uh, that was actually a gospel song of ours that uh <clears throat> the fact that we all grew up together and and our uh parents you know pretty much helped us to uh, uh they pretty much um supported our careers over time but they would always tell us be careful down the path the wrong path don't want you going down the wrong path to go down the 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 light you know that would be slipping in the darkness exactly the so that's basically where that came from and we heard it on a gospel station back when the song was out so a lot of people covered it and then next thing you know a lot of uh, uh reggae groups covered it back back then in fact one of the groups that's uh uh, that covered it is coming here uh, to play uh, uh, Black uh, Black Uhura. Yeah, yeah, they they covered it too. They, in fact, they do it exactly our, our way. But a lot of jazz musicians covered it also. You know, like Ramsey Lewis, uh, Cleveland Eaton, his old bass player. Um, hmm, who else? Uh, a lot of groups. I, I just can't think of it right. Uh, a lot of the groups right now. But a lot of people covered that song. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's part of having an enduring legacy when you make that kind of impact on people and other people can, can pick it up and do it. Of rappers, of course. A Say again? Hip-hop, a lot of hip hop. Right. <laughs> but uh, 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 the majority of our music's been covered, and that's, that's an honor. And sampled, like you were saying, yeah. and incorporated in that, in that modern way. Final one, why can't we be friends? Ah, we were in Tokyo years ago before we uh, did that song. And uh, what happened was that... that uh, uh, territorial we were getting ready to do a major gig outdoors festival and we noticed that there was some fights going on as usual every time we would get ready to go on we would have to stay in a holding position before it was time to go out because it was always some fights got started why and we realized it's because all the people that came to see us play were all from different genres of the world and they uh, started possessing possessing us you know that's my band no that's my group <laughs> you know so but just so happened in, in tokyo at that time you had uh, 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 a whole bunch of people from different parts of the asian world battling with each other just like in uh, california you have like the puerto ricans the cubans and the mexicans you know and everyone's battling because that's my band and it's just you know the fact that we are a multicultural band, you know, with multi, uh, multicultural type of music, we cover everyone, you know, and that's that's basically uh, uh, we bring the world together, including animals. Oh, it's a great thing! And so you're looking at, so you're just like, why can't we all be friends, guys? Is that what the message? That's, that's what it's about. So we that we were able to finish the song because of that, because of uh, everywhere we go, there was always a fight that would break out. Why can't we we just be friends? Yeah, you know? so. It went from there. <laughs> that's, a, that's an incredible one. Uh, as we go to wrap it up with you, uh, the last time that you... Re- that last time. Say again? You said that last time. <laughs> oh, just as a, as, a, as a final note. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> when's, uh, what, what's your plans for the future? Anything coming up that you want to uh, put, put a uh, plug out there for? Yeah, uh, li- living and staying healthy <laughs> and uh, being able to c- uh, continuously play for our rock and roll hall of fans because they put us here and they can take us out <laughs> so and whatever we can do uh, extra beyond that like record some more music you know uh, when the time is right uh maybe do a movie maybe continue working with Cheech and chong and if they do a mu- movie they promised uh, that we would be a part of it and uh, like we made them a part of our record that we did put out um the uh, evolutionary so they were a part of that so uh, again, I mean, we were the, the first music that ever played in a movie was Up in Smoke, <laughs> Cheech and Chong, Lowrider. So, so it's just that here we are again, and we did like four years uh, 
with Cheech and Chong, you know, playing music with them. We did like a Broadway, kind of like a Broadway play, I would mm -hmm. call it. That was fun. It was very good. So. Oh, they're great dudes, and it's great to, to have had them back together and doing their magic. They were here. We had some, spent some time with them last year when they came. But we, but we will do something eventually uh, for the people, and I think that might be one of them. Or we'll do something with George Lopez, you know. But, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of stuff with him, too. Or whoever or whatever comes about, we'll look at it and, and uh, we'll evaluate it and, and analyze it, and, and then we'll truncate it, erase it. <laughs> make it happen there you go <laughs> it's Lonnie <laughs> what did you think I was going to say <laughs> it's Lonnie Jordan from the band War and uh, they're at the Blue Note through Sunday really appreciate getting to talk to you thank you for taking thank some you. time for us brother thank you think I appreciate it